down Highland Park, and I, I think, why couldn't she have a car? Uh, she'd have to try to get rides so that she, she could get to, to her family she was visiting. She spent a lot of time visiting, brought many families to church, worked with many families. No car, no way to go. Not only that, but I found that she b did babysitting for some spending money. And I, I knew, a little, I thought, well, I guess he's trying to help her. To, but I thought he could send her some money. He could, he could do, this is a little too far. Do you know it wasn't too far at all? Do you know that this, that a millionaire has something to fight that, that no one else, we couldn't understand? You think I'd like to try? <laughs> I'd like to try. No, I don't know that you'd like to try. How the character of children of money can be hurt. How wise a, a moneyed man or woman is who sees to it that her children or his children do not have that money in their formative years, that they, they get the privilege of learning to work, of learning to earn, of having the challenge. of uh, uh, Money is a burden upon people. We have students at Hiles Anderson College, not many. <laughs> They're also poor. But once in a while, we have students at Hiles Anderson College. Uh, there's some money in the background. It's never been, I've never seen it be a, a really happy situation for them. They're always afraid that, uh, the, uh, a girl's always afraid the guy will be scared to date her because he can't uh, court her in, uh, with that kind of money in the way she would be accustomed if she, if, they knew it. I mean, there's all kinds of complications. Uh, they're afraid that people, if they knew it, would uh, will take advantage of their money. Uh, they don't know how much they should try to earn. They don't know if they if it's right for them to get a job and take a job away from other people or not. So they don't have the the right to even choose whether they should work or not. It's not really that happy a situation. Uh, oh, that you would learn not to fight and give. To, for your children, train, teach, love. You can't do too much of any of that. Help build character, uh, guide, teach them to work. But to go say, I want one on the right hand and one on the left. <laughs> that, I, that just sounds like some some woman that I might hear coming. Up. Or, or uh, but she was she wasn't even subtle. Most of you'd be a little more subtle, and you'd say, Now I'm not asking for any favors for my children. Uh, oh, no, that I wouldn't want to do that. You know I wouldn't want to do that. But I just wondered, you know, that's the way you do it. I know I've done it. Uh, this lady prayed an, an ambitious and disappointing prayer. She didn't begin to know where, <laughs> what was going on. She, I, as they say, in sla she was strictly out to lunch <laughs> as far as brains were concerned, evidently. Since the master was to soon set up his kingdom, uh, she thought that they might as well settle something right now that had vexed and divided the disciples from the first day they had come together. Who should be greatest? <laughs> Let's just get it settled. She wanted to get down to business and, you know, just take the, take the thing out all uh, so it wouldn't be a decision that had to be made, I guess. She was doing everybody a favor to see so we could just get it all checked out here. Jesus tried to teach them proper views of great greatness. Listen to him. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. If you desire to be truly great, you must be childlike. True childlikeness is self-forgetfulness. He said, Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And we would say, If you desire to be truly great, you probably are to become as a child. She was one of his followers, and he was, uh, uh, he, he knew her well. And so she came up and said, will you do something for me? You know how it is when, when you get to be friends with somebody, they feel like, well, I can ask some favors. She followed Jesus. She pro probably uh, ha had helped him. You know, uh, if, you ever ha if you're a Christian worker and, and you have those people who help you in the Christian work, then they want favors back. Because they weren't really doing it for God. They were, they were doing it for you. And they expect you to do it back then. I think it's wonderful for you to look out for those who, who help you in God's work. And I think you should. But, I, but they shouldn't expect it. Because they're doing it for God. They have their rewards. So there, there's no, there's nothing, there are no favors there that should be asked at all. It's just that, that those who have people working for them need to look out for their people. I, you know, you talk out of two sides, both sides of your mouth, don't you? I'm saying to those of you who have people who help you, look out for them. Take care of them. I'm saying for those of you who do for someone else in the work of God, 
Don't think you're going to get anything extra. Don't ever ask for anything extra. You have your reward if you did it for Jesus. She was smart, but she prayed a dumb prayer. Uh, it was unconditional. She wanted her way no matter what, regardless of what anyone thought or what it brought. Evidently, she didn't think about what being closest to Jesus meant. She was spiritually stupid. She equated a position with a blessing. She thought if they got certain position, they would get blessing. We always think the grass is greener on the other side. There's no kind of position that can guarantee abundant living. You don't, you don't get joy, happiness, and abundant living by, by gaining a position, a title. Some of, the, some of the best people in the world and the most used people in the world do have not had high titles. Now, some have had. And uh, just, uh, just as rich can be, people can be used and poor people can be used, uh, titled people can be used and those who do not have titles. There's no kind of position that can guarantee abundant living. Uh, do you think janitor is a really high title? Probably not. And yet there have been some janitors in schools that will be long remembered and and. and, and Right now, some of you are thinking of someone who was in your school years and years and years, and he was the person that the kids went to when they had a problem. He was the person, he, he just really knew everything about that school. Principals came and went. Teachers came and went. You know what, the kind I'm talking about? But the janitor stayed. And you talk about that janitor, and you tell your kids about that janitor. Now, who had the position there in a school like that? The principal or the janitor? The janitor probably had more influence than the principal. A person makes the title. You don't, a, you, a title is empty if the person doesn't have the power of God to, to give, give some weight to that title. Gaining a title doesn't mean a thing. Gaining a place doesn't mean a thing. And if you do have the power of God, you don't have to have title, you don't have to have place, you don't have to have position, you don't have to have money, you don't have to have anything. You can have or you don't have to have if you have the power of God on your life. Isn't that exciting to know that it's open to anyone? It's available to anyone, and that God delights in seeming to use those that no one would think should be used. The prayer was so selfish. She, cared, she didn't care what ha happened to other, the others. She didn't care about their mamas. And you know, sometimes you're that way, Mama. You want your child to get the lead in the play. You want your child to get first place and first chair in the band, uh, trumpet section of the band. You want all this for you. What about the other people's children? Do you ever want for them? Do you ever think about that? Or are you just pulling all the strings to be sure your child gets it? She cared not that they, that they could help, whether they could help others or not. She was just saying, give my sons first place, whether it helps in the kingdom of God or whether it hinders that kingdom. Evidently, unconditional. I want right hand, left hand. She forgot the rights of the other disciples. She forgot uh, that, the, that uh, she was putting the kingdom of God in a subordinate place. She wasn't saying what would be the best for the cause. Where would the, where would the best place be for the cause? Then let's see. If that would be their best place, then my sons are going to be happier too because they're going to be a part of helping the cause. This thinking was foreign to her, and it's foreign to many of us as we go fighting and clawing for our children, hurting them every step of the way. Put the will of the master in a subordinate place, and you'll be sorry every time. It, it was full of conceit. She wanted them to th share the throne of Jesus. She want listen to this. She wanted to have his power without paying his price. Now listen again. She wanted to have his power without paying his price. There's a price to pay for power. Are you sure you want to pay that price? Are you sure you want your children to pay that price? Was she ready to see her sons suffer the mo more than any of the other disciples as they were closest to him? The suffering and the blessing were going to be with those who were nearest Jesus. Is this what she was ready to
to face, or did she just want the glory? Oh, they would have had some privileges and some opportunities that no one else had. There's no doubt about that. They'd, uh, they would have also suffered as none of the others suffered. Any of these, any people uh, who, I, I'm thinking of Paula Teva Boss. She just married Dave Hiles, January 16, 1976. I, I had the privilege, and, and I felt it was a great honor to be asked to speak at, at her shower where all the teenagers uh, attended because of Brother Dave being in charge of the teenage work. And I asked a couple men of God, what, what woman of the Bible could I use in this? And they said, Mary. And I thought that was strange. And they went ahead to say, well, Mary was uh, called out to do a difficult job. And although there will be some honor and there will be some glory that other girls won't have because of Brother Dave's position, and right off there was, because the shower was a, a beautiful, beautiful thing with, with many, many, many people attending, lovely gifts that some girls wouldn't get, you see. But then right off, she also will be left alone uh, a lot as Brother Dave goes out to speak. She also will suffer in the criticism that comes to people who are in the limelight. You see, uh, that's great to have the right hand and the left hand. And it's also a very sad thing at times if it's God's will. The abundant life is there, and it's for you, and he'll give you the grace to, to accept graciously the good things and to accept graciously those things that are not so good. But often people do not see the both sides. They want the power. They want the excitement and the limelight. They don't want the suffering that goes with it. Romans eight sixteen through 18 says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Philippians 3.10, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. He said, Ye know not what ye ask. I am coming to power through suffering. Jesus, Jesus, would, uh, Jesus would have to tell them that. He said, ye know not what ye ask. He was coming to power through suffering. It's through being lifted up on a cross that he'll draw all men unto himself. Are you willing to drink of the cup of which I'm able to drink? And they stupidly said, we're able. We're able. W were they able? Had they counted the cost? Just a few days later, they were asleep while he prayed in the garden. No one's able to be anything or do anything independent of the Lord Jesus. Uh, the prayer assumed that Jesus just handed out favors regardless of the fitness of the receiver. Uh, just, just got a hold, just, just said, yeah, yeah, that'll be all right. You know, whoever asks first, that's who gets the right hand and the left hand. That's not Jesus. And that's, that's why we can't go at... We don't know if it's best for our child. We don't know what's best. We don't know what's right for the others who are in their peer group when we go try to, to get our way for our children and fight their battles for them. God can only give what we are fit to receive. He gives to all of us the very best that we permit Him to give. He wants to give. He wants us to have the very best and that which is the best for us. But he, he'll give it to us if we'll permit him to give it and if we're in the right condition for him to give it. It is right to pray for greatness for ourselves and our loved ones if we realize the path we and they must take. It, it's all right if it's greatness not to want glory for yourself, but greatness as far as being used to God then pray for that. If you're sure you want your children to go along that path that comes with greatness for God. The Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. There is no other road. There is no other way. 
Whoever wants to be the great man among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of all. Jesus became the highest because he stooped the lowest. May God help us to walk this way. There are certain needs of people that must be met. Uh, let me name some, and you may want to take them down, or you, and possibly you'll want to think about these again. Listen to them on the tape recorder again. Number one, people need love and affection. Folks have, they, they have to feel their love. Little babies will die for the lack of love. This has been proven over and over and over again by those who work with infants who have, who have been uh, left alone. They can die for the lack of love. People will do most anything or go any place for love and affection. They'll go toward those places where they feel loved. Don't you? Isn't that where you go? If you want to, if you want to go to, to get into trouble, if you want to go to where, where you're spurned and rejected, uh, there's probably something wrong with you. We want to go where we're loved and accepted and where we have affection. Then you want to be great. You want your children to be great. You teach them to love. You teach them to show affection for those around them. And they'll, that's the greatness that God can give them, that they love. Number two, people have to have a sense of worth. They have to know they're worthwhile. A lot of times, your children won't develop uh, this sense of worth because uh, uh, you, you get, grab everything for them so fast they don't have to be worthwhile. They don't have to learn to, to work. They don't have to learn to handle human relations problems themselves that you'll jump in and do it for them. And they end up growing up without a sense of worth. They have to have you. They're crippled. They're emotionally crippled. I think there are people who are crippled, cannot work, and they have healthy bodies and they, have, they can walk, but they're as crippled as a person who has, a, uh, has crippled legs and is paralyzed. They're emotionally crippled, have never been, don't know a thing about how to work, how to, how to handle their own lives, how to handle human relations, because someone's always done it for them. Sometimes it's because no one has taught them no one did it for them, nor, but there was no one there for an example either. But for some reason or other, they, they, they have no sense of worth. Teach your children to have a sense of worth. They'll be great. Great like God would want them to be great. Great in a way that you don't have to go say, could they sit on the right hand and on the left? They'll be placed by God where he wants them. And sometimes it might be the right hand and the left. People need self-confidence. And, and I don't apologize for this word anymore. I used to say, uh, be, uh, say uh, how can we say it? Christ confidence. Or, but it is self-confidence. It's confidence that you yourself can do a job with God in you, with the Holy Spirit working through you. There needs to be a, a sense of that worth, that sense of being worthwhile. If you feel you're worth something, you probably will have that confidence that you may not be the greatest person in the world and you may not know everything there is to know and perhaps you have many failures, but you know who you are, you know God's made you in his own image and you know what he wants you to do and you're going toward that goal in your life that God has set for you. Number four, there's a need to worship in the heart of every man. Missionaries have found this time after time and have talked about it, finding that when they get to some foreign land, there is some kind of worship always. And, of course, in our country, there's a worship of things, of materialism, of secularism, uh, of humanism. There's a worship of man. So we're going to worship. Teach your child to go out and just go out alone and begin to say thank you, God, for everything and, and thank you, Lord, and begin to, to, to just praise the Lord. And they'll be great as they praise someone else. And most of all, the Lord, they'll find the greatness that you're looking for for them. Uh, to take your child out and say, L let's see how many things we can thank God for. You thank him for something, I'll thank him for something. You thank him for something, I'll thank him for something. And see how far you can go. Maybe you'll laugh with it and maybe it'll be a different kind of worship from what you had in mind when I mentioned the word worship. 
I really don't think worship is saying a holy, holy, holy. And now we have come into the, I think worship is saying, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Thank you for all you've done for me. You can have a worship time and you can teach your children to worship and that will bring them into true greatness where they will uh, uh, be on the right hand and on the left. They need to be free from anxiety. Now, none of us are going to be completely free from anxiety. You're, you're probably saying, I'd like to be free from anxiety, too. I wish I didn't have to worry about how much money for the next bill and where the next bill's coming from and my health and all these problems. But you can teach your child, as a little child, to take the problems to the Lord and leave them there. Just talk, You teach him by your doing that very thing yourself. You you pray together as a family and make a list. My little sister was telling me about the list. My little sister is 30-some years old. And don't laugh when I say my little sister. She's 30, I guess, 31. Uh, she was telling me about uh, uh, the list prayer list they put on the side of their refrigerator and what a joy it's been to cross off different matters of prayer. And that's something that my niece Beth has been watching and seeing. And therefore, she, she's learning what it is to be free from anxiety, to know that you can take your cares and your burdens and, your, uh, and the things about which you're anxious and put it on the refrigerator wall, or the side of the refrigerator, and then, and then God will take care of them and you cross them off as you trust Him. I don't know how you're teaching your child to be free of anxiety, but there is a way. As, as you show them that you give, that you let the Lord take care of your worries and that you don't worry. Now, if you're sitting around worrying all the time and, and hashing over the same old thing, the same old problem, and I don't know what we're going to do. We just, you know, we need to, we need to watch this. You know, sometimes every, every time you sit down to figure the bills, uh, maybe you and your husband sit down and figure the bills, and your husband says, oh, we're going to go to the poor house. And, and the little kids, they don't even know what the poor house is. Well, I don't even myself, for that matter. I guess I lived in one. Uh, there when I was talking about those ham and beans in that trailer court, but uh, I don't. I never th have thought I was poor. My dad said we didn't have all that money one time in my life, but I didn't even know it. I didn't even know we weren't that we were poor. But he says he says we were when I was growing up. I I didn't know it, uh, and I I I, I don't think uh, we didn't have any extreme poverty by any means. My father was fortunate even during the depression to have a a good job as a foreman in a flour mill. Uh, and for that day, uh, we I'm sure we were cared for quite adequately. But you, you say, we're going to the poor house. We're going to the poor house. And, and they, they, they don't know what's going to happen. They're not, they, they have visions in, the, in their mind of the monster coming and carrying them away or a big bad policeman coming and, and taking them to some kind of a debtor's, du debtor's dungeon they've seen on television or something. And, and, and we don't realize they don't have the experience to understand that what we mean is, oh, dear, we've got more bills than money again. Uh, we are anxious, but not that anxious about it, but we're teaching them real anxiety. People need to feel free from anxiety. Now, of course, those same children need to know that we just can't spend money on everything we want to spend money on and that we have to watch it. And But, uh, you know, but it needs to be realistic and not just a horrible worry all the time that we're, gonna, we're going to the poor house. They need purpose and meaning. Number six, people need purpose and meaning in their lives. Why all the drug addiction? Why all the kids running away from home? Because there's, they don't have any challenge. They don't have anything to do. They don't know what they're on, in the, on this earth for, in this world for. They don't understand. Now, people, all of this can come through the Word of God. All of this can come through living for Jesus. He'll give you love and affection. He'll be love and affection in you. The Holy Spirit in you will love through you. So you'll be loved and you'll be able to love as you let the Word of God saturate your life and as you let Him flow in and through you and His Spirit. Sense of worth. Who can give you a sense of worth more than the Lord Jesus? He died for you. He, that's how worthwhile you are. He died for you that you might go to heaven. He didn't want you to go to hell. Sense of worth? I should say so. Uh, uh, when, when we know that, that God didn't want us to go to hell, that he didn't made us for, make us for hell, and he didn't make hell for us, that gives us a tremendous sense of worth. And then to think that he bothered, <laughs> if you could call it that, to, to inspire these men to write this holy word of God that we might have a guidebook. He thought we were worthwhile, didn't he? Sense of importance? We have it. He thinks we're so important that he has allowed us to be his soul winners. 
He's allowed us to be the carrier of his Holy Spirit who will work in and through us and win souls through us. Sense of worth. We, we are somebody. Not in ourselves, but through Jesus. Not independent of Jesus, but because of Jesus. But because we are somebody, we don't need to have the right hand and the left. All we need to do is say, Lord Jesus, wherever you want me to be, that's what I want. And that's where I want to be. Need for worship? Oh, he'll, he'll teach you through, every time you pick up the Word of God and say, Thank you, Lord. I just can't believe this is for me. What a wonderful uh, thing you've written to me. This, this beautiful passage of Scripture for me, I can claim this promise. You can worship just like that. Just saying, Oh, Lord. Oh, my, and it won't be a put-on thing. It'll just be something straight from your heart. Free from anxiety? Be not anxious. Don't be anxious. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Purpose and meaning? He has a plan for your life. Are you on the road? Are, are, are you helping your children find the pl his plan for their life? That's the way you can help them. You don't have to promote them. You don't have to be their uh, uh, promotion, PR man, <laughs> public relations man. You don't have to be the, the go-between. You don't have to come in and fight their battles for them. Teach them, train them, love them, teach them the Word of God, spend time with them, have fun with them, play with them. And you know what? Give them these types of needs. Help them to ha have these needs met, and they'll be able to have the very place in that God wants for them whether it's on the right hand, whether it's on the left, whether it's way back, whether it's at the end or in the middle, they'll be happier than anybody's children because they are in the right place for them, the place God has for them. Are you in that place?